Hi, I'm Alistair Ben, and this is episode five of Vision and Light. This week, I'm talking to a really great friend of mine, Theo Bosboom, who I've been a fan of his work for well over a decade. Theo is someone who produces incredibly intimate images within the landscape and sees the world in a very unique way and is very confident about his articulation and expression. We are going to be talking about his latest book called Shaped by the Sea, which is a collection of images he's made on the Atlantic coast of Europe, and it's just sensational. If you're interested in checking out Theo's work, check the links in the notes and you can go and perhaps even purchase a copy of this incredible book. But let's uh, get on. In addition to talking about uh, the Shaped by the Sea book, we also talk about the way he sees his interactions with the landscape, his approach in the landscape, and a lot of the philosophy behind why and how he photographs. So let's uh, meet Theo Bospom. Hi Theo, how you doing, man? Hi Alistair, I'm great. What about you? <laughs> not too bad, not too bad. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's nice to see you again after all these years. It's been a while. Yeah, it was um, a cold ice. I uh, I remember on the red beach at Vic, I think, um, with the wild sea and the big waves. That's and right. We were both leading a workshop, I think. Um, That's right. Yeah. It's uh, shortly after that, I stopped doing Iceland workshops. It just got crazy, crazy busy yes. for a while. I, I dare say they're, uh, it's quite quiet now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should go now there. Uh, I, I was there in March, actually, in early March. And it, it okay. was also okay. I think they had a, a problem last year because Wow Air collapsed, uh, the cheap airline. That's right. Yeah, and actually the tourism decreased with about twenty or thirty percent last year, which is yeah. maybe bad for some people, but a, a blessing for others, like photographers and, and maybe nature in the country. Um, and and I, I stopped with the South Island tours in the same year, probably as you did. But um, yeah. I'm doing stuff in other parts of the of the country, and it's that's right. It's very very good. It's uh, I mean in the West Fjords. Uh, I shouldn't probably saying this on, on YouTube, <laughs> but, <laughs> but in the uh, West Fjords in autumn last year, we met one photographer, other photographer on a ten days tour. So. That was That's great. You, Just find now, your own your own part of Iceland. Yeah. You've now killed the Western fjords. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are no icon, uh, icons, so uh, I'm That's very pretty, true. pretty safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, you know, I think I mentioned to you before we started recording this that when I started the Vision and Light uh, video cast, podcast, the, the idea was to to just chat with Adam Gibbs. I mean, him and I have known each other for a long time. And we, we used to talk quite regularly uh, on, on this sort of chat, you know, maybe just once every couple of weeks or whatever. And what we found okay. ourselves doing was just shooting the shit, basically, about landscape photography. And uh, your name came up often because both of us are okay. massive fans of, of your photography. Uh, so it just seemed like a natural progression. To, it's the other way around too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're too kind. You can you can come back. <laughs> <laughs> but the so you you're not on YouTube, you know, you're not a you're not a, a vlogger, uh, but you're a no. prolific uh creator of incredible photographs. So for before we get started in the actual sort of uh and it's not an interview, it's more just like a chat, like, you know, yep, we're meeting up right. for a cup of coffee. I've got my coffee. Um, I've finished mine. <laughs> oh, well, we'll take a break and make sure you get topped up. But so just for the for the benefit of people who may not know who you are, uh, just a brief introduction to sort of say who you are, where you are, and your background in landscape photography. Yeah. Um, 
Now, name Theo Bosboom, um, born and raised and still living in the Netherlands. Uh, right now, my base is Arnhem in the east of the Netherlands, but I was born on the coast in, in Noordwijk, a small town. Um, well, obviously, the Netherlands is, is not a nature's paradise. It's one of the most densely populated countries in the world. And we have only very small pieces of nature left. And, and these pieces of nature are usually very much guarded and, um, well, um, how you say it, uh, controlled by humans. So it's virtually impossible to get lost in the Netherlands. Uh, nature is not dangerous unless you go swimming at a storm or so. But you really have to do your best to get into trouble into nature. So that is my background. Um, Still, I got a, a nice portion of nature in my youth because my parents always took me to the mountains, to the Alps, uh, to go hiking, to go walking. Um, and we, we spent a lot of time at the coast uh, where I learned at a young age the, the power of the sea and uh, well, the, the, the changeability of the weather and uh, the dynamics of the beach. So I, I think it's, it's still in me after all those years. Um, I first had a, a very different career. I, I'm a professional photographer since 2013, uh, and mainly landscape, but uh, also nature photography in, in the broadest sense of the word. So I do some other stuff as well. And before that, I was a lawyer uh, for quite some years. Um, I did copyright law, which is still useful every now and then. <laughs> I'm one of the guys that always hopes that they steal my images. Um, <laughs> so I know what to do. Um, and I did a bit of uh, a, a bit of internet law. Um, so these two were my my specialization, and I, I really enjoyed it for a long time. Um, but in 2003, at a, a trip to Africa of two months, one month Namibia, one month Tanzania, I brought a proper camera for the first time and 50 rolls of slide film. And well, it was the yeah the first time that I got immersed in photography during a holiday, and it really grabbed me. And because people always told me, if you look through the lens of a camera, your whole holiday you miss so much, uh, you don't see anything. But for me, it worked the other way around. I, I started noticing things that I, I never noticed before. What is the direction of the light? Um, of course, in Africa, you, you always look for animals or birds in the land. So I was uh, very much aware of things and it, it was a very nice experience. Um, so when I returned to the Netherlands, I wanted to pick up photography, uh, but I was afraid that it would not be interesting at all uh, mm -hmm. because you know, the, the reasons I mentioned before, the Netherlands doesn't have giraffes or lions and, and not uh, volcanoes or spectacular landscapes. But right. uh, I became a member of a local photo club. Um, I, I actually was inspired and uh, my eyes were opened because there were some people that really made interesting, beautiful photographs of nature in the Netherlands, just at my doorstep, uh, just being creative, um, going at the right time, um, having the knowledge of the area, of course. So it opened my eyes and, uh, well, I, I really jumped into it. Um, and it became, yeah, soon it became much more than a hobby. Mm. It became an obsession more. Um, <laughs> it took me quite some time to make the jump into a professional career because obviously uh, a lawyer's job has some benefits uh, when you look at the financial side of it and uh, security and if you want to pay for your house, etc., etc., family, little kids. Um, yeah. But yeah, I was busy with photography night and day. I found myself staring at the office window a bit too often. Um, <laughs> and, and then I thought it, it's... I just have to go for it and see where it brings me. And if it doesn't work out, I can always go back to something legal. Uh, I mean, the knowledge gets old very quickly, but uh, the experience right. and the way of thinking and analyzing, uh, you don't lose that. So it, it, it was a, a big jump, uh, but still one with a sort of safety net, I think. Uh, right. um, and, uh, 
made a sort of, I, I'm not a guy for business plans and calculations, but I, I promised myself that if it didn't work within five years from a financial point of view, that I had a good feeling that I could continue till I'm really old, uh, then I would stop and, and yeah, sort out a plan B. But um, luckily, this moment um, didn't arrive. I, I'm still managing quite well and still enjoying it. Yeah, there's a lot of similarity uh, in your story to my story in that I, I also had a professional career. I was in international finance for 20 years um, okay. and, and did the same thing about 2009 or so. Um, yeah. I was spending more time out with cameras in my hand than I was traveling for work anyway. So yep. it, it was the same idea. And I got into the education side of things and started writing eBooks and uh, the night photography eBook and then some other eBooks. Yes. Um, and yep. like you, my passion for the sea is, is the same, is that we've spent a lot of time yep. by the ocean and similar places as well, like Iceland and the north coast of Spain and there's Absolutely. the Hebrides and yep. the west of Scotland. So I think yep. you and I have got something quite similar in our DNA. Absolutely, uh, yep. So the, one of the things, I mean, you've mentioned a couple of things that, that are worth coming back to, and this is why I don't start off with a plan necessarily about what we're going to talk about, because the things that you raise as you're talking kind of spark thoughts yep. of inquiry in my mind. So this, this is why I prefer a more informal kind of approach. But the first thing you talked about was that the Western fjords have no icons, uh, yep. and therefore there's nobody there. Um, well, not, obviously, not in summer there are, of course, and in spring because there are puffins. It's it's a sort of icon, that's, but that's the rest true. of the year there, there's nobody. Uh, right, and it's still great for photography because this is one of the things that I think you and I share is that the vast majority of our photography is taken in places that are more anonymous. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, what what is it about that? process that you find the most appealing thing what you know why don't we all just go to the famous places with everybody else <laughs> um well the, there are several reasons i think um first of all i think as a professional photographer i need to think about ways to get my work uh, into the attention of a public it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a huge public but uh, I, yeah i need to live from photography and I think, um, especially also with my preferences and my style, it doesn't make sense for me to go to the iconic places to yeah, make similar images um, that everybody else takes uh, or that are already there in huge numbers because I have nothing to add. Um, my technical skills are not great. My processing skills are mediocre. So uh, this is not the way to go for me. And also, okay. most important, I think it, it doesn't satisfy me. I think um, photography for me is a, a very personal thing. Uh, it's a way of expressing myself. Um, sometimes I can say with photographs what I can't put into words, but, but still it's, it's satisfying. It's, it's uh, good for me. Um, and I think, yeah, if you want your photographs to be personal, then yeah, go to places where uh, not loads of people go or go to these iconic places and, and try to find something new that's also a, a nice challenge but uh, another reason to avoid these places is that that i like silence as well and i right. uh, prefer a beach where i'm alone or maybe one guy or walking the dog uh, instead of uh, 30 photographers or 100 photographers lining up um, to catch totally. the same scene. Um, so there's a, a number of reasons and I think it's also a challenge to go to a beach you don't know or a beach that doesn't have the obvious highlights and see yeah, what you can discover, what you can feel at such a place and, and just yeah, let it come to you. The, the reason I love doing this as a video cast rather than just a podcast is I can see the expression on your face and yes. you, you can see the expression on mine and, and the, the words yeah. that you're saying just resonate with me and just make me feel so joyful because, yes. you know, photo photography to me is a deeply personal thing. You know, it, it's, it I think when you make, I think when you make that decision to be a professional landscape photographer, and I mean that in the, 
in the true sense of the word in that you are dedicating your life to it. You know, it, it's not just something that you do to make money. You and I, you'd still be a lawyer. You'd still be a lawyer. I'd still be in finance. If it was just about making money, we'd have photography Absolutely. as a hobby. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think when you dedicate your life to something like that, the, the passion that you have for it as a, as a life, a self-actualizing, a life-fulfilling thing. Yeah. Um, I, I totally agree with everything you're saying. And one of the things that I find so appealing about your photographs is there's, and um, don't take this the wrong way, but there's something wonderfully ordinary in the subject matter. You know, yes. it's, you're the only person I've ever seen who can point his camera straight down at a shingle beach and photograph, you know, a hundred thousand small stones and stick it on a yeah. wall. And it, and it'd be like, wow, you know, this, this, this is really, you know, and I love that because there's just a, a real authenticity. That's, about oh, that, it. That's, that's a compliment. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, yeah, but, but uh, you might, you might have to listen to a few of those in this. I'm a bit of a fanboy when it comes to you. <laughs> Uh, well, that, that's really nice. I'm I'm getting uh, shy and um, thinking I'm not deserving this, but I, I'll let you talk. Try to let you talk. Um, okay. No, but, but it, it, it's really how I look at the natural world. I think uh, an, an autumn leaf or just a, a single rock or patterns in the sand can be as fascinating as a white landscape um, and if, even more fascinating because if you start to look closely, you, you discover so many things. Uh, it's such a well, I'm not a religious person, but uh, the, the, my my experiences um, in nature, I think they they come close to religious right. feelings or experiences. Uh, uh, but but that, that in its own way, hmm? that that in its own way is a very primal. Res that that in its own way is a very a very primal relationship with the landscape. I mean, that's Absolutely. how our ancestors had their relationship with the landscape. Yep. Was I mean, imagine. 10,000 years ago experiencing a, a, an aurora, you know, or a lightning storm or something like that when yep. you don't have science to, to, tell, to tell you why. Uh, no, that, that's true. I mean, it, it's not a coincidence that, for instance, on Iceland, uh, a majority of the people still believe in elves and, and supernatural things right. because they have a much closer relationship to the landscape and... and um, I like that. I, I want to feel that too. It's something I miss in the Netherlands. I mean, I love my country for many reasons and I have thought seriously about, about moving, but uh, I'm still here uh, mm. uh, and I will probably uh, stay here. Well, not to... Never say never. <laughs> um, Yes, but that's, right. that's a lesson I already learned. But um, still, I, I really love the feeling of being in wilderness, and, and it's right. probably one of the main reasons to go for the professional career, not not to make the money, like you said, but uh, just to yeah have the luxury to immerse yourself in nature much more often. And uh, yeah. So something that's uh, becoming a bit of a recurring theme in this, and it was something I suspected was going to be the case when I started talking to Adam and then I talked to Sean Bagshaw and then obviously last week I was talking to Mark Adamus and now yep. yourself and then later on today I'm talking to Guy Tal who will be on the show a week from Wednesday. Uh, something that's becoming almost a cliche is that I think many of us share the same attributes when we're in the field in the, the way we're allowing the landscape to talk to us and mm. quite often quite i mean mark is a big picture type of guy he's, he's very much a big landscape type of guy he does do intimate landscapes but generally he does prefer yeah. the bigger picture whereas his you, intimate landscapes are really good uh, too though he should do it more often i think it's, it's, well i think I, he I does mean, a, yeah. Yeah, he does he just doesn't show many of them no it, it it's less popular, I know. <laughs> yeah. But the, the one thing that you, uh, Guy, and myself have more in common, I think, is, is photographing really uh, 
small bits of the landscape, really intimate little bits of the landscape. Now, and one of the things yeah. I'm kind of fascinated with is understanding what triggers that engagement for you. Can you kind of talk us through it? I mean, we're going to be showing quite a few of your photographs as a slideshow over the top okay. of this uh, talk. So we will be seeing some of your mm -hmm. images coming up. Um, but what, what sort of things are likely to trigger you to say, ah, right, this is, this is something that I'm interested in? Well, that, that's a good and difficult to answer question because um, it's very intuitive normally. I, I, I don't have a plan to, to, yeah, to go photograph rocks at a certain day or to photograph sand patterns. I just walk on the beach or anywhere in nature and, and look closely, usually to the ground. Um, and yeah, it can be the way the light falls on a, on a certain small scene. It can be the, the structures or the patterns. This is often the case. They, they fascinate me. Um, it can be a, a combination of colors. Um, it can be uh, contradictions uh, somehow. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a wide variety, but it's usually small. Um, although I must say that the first time that I was in Iceland, um, I was really so amazed, so overwhelmed by the landscape that I also did a lot of white landscapes and, and was right. just not able to do more than press the <laughs> shutter with open mouth all the time <laughs> and it took me about a week or so to to come to myself and and started to realize hey i'm a photographer <laughs> i should do a bit more than just record what i'm seeing but at first it was enough because i was so impressed and and i liked it so much what i saw it was so unique um so i kind of understand people who have less time uh, and go on holiday maybe two times a year. Um, and I understand that they do want to photograph the icons. Um, and, and when you have them, it gives also a sort of peace of mind. You can show <laughs> where you were. When I show my work at home, and, and yeah, they could still ask, where have you been? Um, because it not shows immediately uh, from yeah. some uh, pile of rocks or some sand patterns. Uh, they, they could have been taken anywhere. Right. Um, but yeah, for me, these are the scenes that are are interesting, that fascinate me. Uh, how does it work? How do the, how are the patterns created? Um, how does the water work here and, and uh, merge with the water of the sea? Uh, this, this yeah, this all kind of small processes going on that interested me, and and not from a scientific point of view. Sometimes I try to understand them or grab them, but it's it's not important. It's just enough to yeah, to realize uh, that it is going on and it's probably going on for thousands of years, maybe millions of years. And, and it makes me humble and um, yeah, I, I feel good and, and I see the beauty in it, uh, the beauty in the small things. As a lawyer, I learned the devil is in the details, but as a photographer, I see the beauty is in the details. And um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's... <laughs> It, like I've said to you before, the, the thing I love about these converse, conversations, it's almost like there's a certain degree of self-validating going on, is that yeah. it's encouraging to hear other people who I admire seeing yeah. the, the same way that my brain works to a certain extent. And I think what I'm trying to do with all this is to, I think when we run workshops, we're forced to articulate things that we do intuitively and innately. I think that's part of what being a being a, yes. a good a good educator is is being able to yes. articulate the things we don't think about but, but have to manage to articulate them somehow. So yep. during these conversations, I find myself kind of making connections with things in my own mind, uh, and one of them that just came into my my thought there was. I wonder if this fascination with the with the small and the intimate and the anonymous is partly a function of uh, seeking individuality in the landscape. So being able to go anywhere, whether it's iconic or not, and find something yep. graphical, colorful, contrast, juxtapositions, uh, yep. you know, all of these types of things. And I wonder, I wonder if there's layers of engagement, like you said, when you went to Iceland the first time, you, you just get overwhelmed with the big scene. Uh, whereas 
once you've been there, I mean, I, I don't know how many months you've spent in Iceland over the years, probably 12, 15, 16, 24 months or whatever, maybe. Yeah, um, one and a half year, probably something right. like that. And yep. I, I think I'm in the same sort of ballpark in terms of the amount of time I've spent there. And once you've photographed, you know, Skogafoss 10 times <laughs> already, it's, it's automatic. You're going to start seeing yep. other things. Um, yep. And I just wonder if there's two things. One is layers of engagement, which is like you see the obvious and then you start to sort of isolate bits within that 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 can almost be fractal in nature in that you get this small yep. scale versions of large things and the second thing was escaped my mind completely uh, <laughs> it's gone again <laughs> this is old age kicking in but yeah that, that that layers of engagement i think are incredible but also it's come back to me now which is if you go somewhere when you're leading workshops and the light is poor I think, I think a lot of big landscapes rely on good light or good atmospheric conditions to, to sort of pull the whole true. thing together. Yep. Whereas yep. anonymous landscapes, you can photograph them in the pouring rain. Yeah, that's true. I think that's, yeah, both are very important. Uh, the smalls you can make more personal, you can make them your own. You can walk around them, you can search new ones where, where I can see they stand in one place and if you're lucky you can walk a bit um, left and right but uh, your freedom is very limited um, mm. whereas the small scenes yeah you can find them everywhere you can walk around them you can uh, approach them from any corner um, so that and uh, you have the freedom that whatever the light or the weather conditions you can photograph them and i think if you have this freedom uh, you don't have to wait for a good picture to sh to to emerge you can create good pictures any time of the day and in, in any type of weather and i think that yeah that is that is great um also it fits much better to me because i'm i can be very dedicated and i can work really hard in the field i can work for 10 hours on one image in the field if i have to and if i believe in it but <laughs> uh, waiting for one hour <laughs> for something to happen or not that that uh, i can do I, i've tried heights and uh, tried to photograph wildlife from a, a sort of height that you pull over your um, yeah. yourself and then wait see if the deer or the fox comes uh, maybe not and then you are there early in the morning and the light is great and you see all kind of beautiful things happening in the landscape uh, the light um, that hits the, the the leaves and the trees and then i get really unhappy in my, uh, in my height and i think well it's probably not a day where a lot of deer are coming around so <laughs> in after 10 minutes i get nervous and after 30 minutes i will leave the height and start <laughs> other things because i want to be yeah i want to be productive as well uh, right. when i am in the right mood and i have the inspiration i right don't wait for something that might come or might not come uh, so that's another advantage of, of doing the small scenes so something something else that i'm kind of fascinated with and i think something that's great about talking to lots of individually creative people is your images are, I, I, see, I see your images and they're, they're very clearly you, you know, they're, they're, they're identifiably you. Um, and I wonder that as the creator of those images, do you see yourself in your own work? Is there facets of your personality that you might see in a raging seascape or are there part, parts of your personality you might see in a foggy forest scene? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I, I never looked at my images in this way, I think, but uh, still probably uh, it is a reflection of my character as well. Um, I think I'm a person that likes harmony, uh, uh, likes um, that everything is, is organized. Uh, um, and I like probably light more than dark. Um, I, th I think life is very hard and uh, we can better make it uh, a bit lighter and, and look at <laughs> the positive side of things. So many of my images are, are <laughs> quite light and um, well, 
now I'm saying this, I'm looking at you. <laughs> you're, looking, <laughs> you're looking worried right now. I know you prefer the dark scenes as well. <laughs> you can explain to me later, but I, well, I don't we, we know. We can, I'm we just, can talk about that. I think I, I'm just thinking out loud. Maybe I would have to do some more uh, observations on my own work, but that there must be some kind of reflection of my personality. But I think I'd, I'd like to reflect on others' works uh, and images better than my own. Uh, that makes me a bit uncomfortable. I'll, I'll leave it to others to to judge and uh, analyze. Uh, I mean, still, that, that's I, very I think interesting. My, my images are personal. That, yes. It's really, really interesting because I think, you know, we, I think social media to a certain extent has created a platform for photography that makes, I, I think it detaches us from the personal to a certain extent. It, it, mm -hmm. there's, there's a, there's a, we know what's popular. We know what images are going to be popular. Uh, I remember about, it must have been, seven or eight years ago, I think you joined 500px brief, yes. briefly. Um, and, <laughs> and I remember you posting your images and I hope you don't mind me saying, but, but they just, they weren't popular at all on no. 500px. Still not. <laughs> for, 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 for very good reason is that yeah. not because they're not incredible, but because they're, they're just not that platform's interpretation of amazing. Um, and, and I think that's unfortunately the way that a lot of things have gone is when we see what images are popular, it, it kind of encourages us to make images in that style because we want to be popular, because we want to grow our business or we want people to come in our workshops and all of this yep. stuff. And yes. I think it's very, I think it's very difficult with a quiet voice to, to get the attention that people with a louder voice are getting, yep. uh, because your, your images tend to be quite quiet. Yes, yeah, more the, the whispering and shouting kind of images, yes. And of course, that, that is a challenge in times like these where, I mean, I'm on Instagram too, and I see colleagues with uh, large amounts of followers and images that do very well and get shared all over uh, places. But... Um, yeah, you, you have to ask yourself, why am I on social media and uh, know the limitations? And um, it can be very yeah, discouraging um, if you look at the numbers, but I think you have to, yeah, to stay close to yourself. Um, I mean, it's, it's the same with photo contests. It can also be really discouraging if you enter photo contests and, and you, you win nothing and you see the loud speaking images uh, getting awarded. Um, but yeah, if you stay close to yourself and uh, accept the fact that um, not everybody likes your images or even notices your images, um, then a part of the distress is already put away. Um, I think if you choose a style um, or you choose subject, that are less popular than, for instance, wide landscapes or, or lions with, with cups in their mouth or images that everybody likes, then you have to accept that you will lose people. I mean, right. my, my grandma was a big fan when I started with photography because I also started with the, the wide landscapes and, and images that everybody likes and understands. And uh, well, I left this track pretty soon and, and um, I saw on my grandpa that the <laughs> grandma that, that she left uh, left me too because <laughs> um, she didn't get it anymore. And, and that's okay. I mean, I don't blame her and I, I don't blame a large part of the world for not getting attracted to these kind of images. You have to accept it. But I know that there is a, a smaller community that, that gets inspired by it and that really like it or that are touched by it. And, and that is, for me, as much as rewarding uh, as the, the high numbers of superficial likes that I might get with an image that, that is not really me. I mean, um, it's the same with photo contests. In, in, I, I enjoy taking part of it. Uh, I'm, I'm a competitive guy every now and then. And, um, I, I know all the disadvantages and that you shouldn't take it too seriously. But in the beginning, I know that I entered images that I thought 
would be liked by the jury and, and not necessarily images that were mine or that I liked right. very much. But I, I stopped with that. And uh, this is much better because if you win something, then you know it's, it comes from the heart and um, that, right. that you are appreciated by personal images that, that you are uh, completely behind. <clears throat> Um, and it's uh, I, I act the same on social media. I sometimes do make the, the wide landscape with the gorgeous light. I mean, if you're out in nature often, then of even course. to me, it could happen. Um, but I seldom post these images because right. uh, and I get a lot of likes for a style that it's not really me. So I, right. I try to be focused in this and then show the images that I like that that are personal to me, and but then still you you build up uh, followers and um, people that appreciate your work. It, it only goes slower, and you will not reach the the high numbers. But you maybe you don't need them to build a business and to keep yourself going. One of the things I'm very focused on because two things. First of all, is I don't think photography is taught particularly well generally because I, I think when you when you teach rules and templates compositional templates i think it can be a very blinkering thing i think we can yeah. look at an image that's already been made and analyze it and kind of understand why it feels the way it does but i don't think yeah. producing images to a template in the field is a very creative way to move forward as an artist but one, so that's one thing that my mission statement to try and, you know, look at photography from a more innate, intuitive, emotional, um, you know, the unconscious rather than the conscious is what yeah. my, my area of interest really comes from these days. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and the second thing is that I think as, as social media grows and more and more people are out there with cameras, I think getting the attention is getting harder than it ever was. You know, back in 2010, there might have been a couple of hundred photographs of Kirkafell on the internet. Um, yep. And now there's a million or two million or a hundred million photographs of Kirkafell. I don't know the numbers. So yep. therefore, taking a photograph of Kirkafell with an aurora over the top of it is not remarkable anymore. You know, so no, it's the because standard. We're, we're, yeah. it's a standard, yeah. So, so making those types of photographs isn't going to make you popular. Um, and I wonder if the as the external validation gets harder to achieve, that the internal self actualization benefits of photography, the therapy, the you know, the calming of the soul, the 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 engagement with nature, the childlike fascination that we can have with with the intimate. I wonder if those things, in conjunction with us all being locked down right now for a number of months, I wonder when we all come out, if people are suddenly going to have more of an appreciation for the, for the small and the intimate than they had before, because they've been forced to sort of bring in their boundaries of expectation. That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I hope you're right. It, it, it could be like that. Uh, but it that's a cynical part of me. It could also be the other way around that they are dying for the, the great wide landscapes and the, and the drama again after being locked up in the house. Fun, so funnily many. enough, I, I've just remembered that last weekend when China opened its lockdown situation, there was all those photographs last weekend from Yellow Mountain when there was, okay. the place was just overrun <laughs> with people. Okay. So yeah, everyone just went it's, straight to Huangsan. That is helpful, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, okay. No, no but, but I, I understand what, you, what you're trying to say. And I, yeah, I think maybe for, for some people and some photographers, it can work that way. Because uh, I think a lesson that, that is learned by many uh, of us now is that we are running too fast and we are too busy doing all kinds of things that, that are maybe not really necessary um, that are healthy our agenda, yeah healthy the agendas are too full um, always uh, there's not enough time for resting uh, reflection and I, I'm not better than anyone else because I'm, I'm running around the whole year too I, I sure. realize this every now and then but um, I mean 
it's it's this could be a benefit from the whole situation that, that more and more people start realizing what we're doing and to what kind of changes this may lead this is very uncertain um things are hard to change and maybe three days after we are free again everybody has forgotten what has happened but no, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a bit hopeful that that some things will will do something within the minds and hearts of people well i think i think your work is is a it might have a quiet voice in its own right, but I think it's a strong voice for an appreciation of, of the anonymous. I, I, I really do. Now, something I did think about before uh, I knew we were going to have this conversation was you're a very project-oriented photographer. You're someone who works on uh, themes. You know, you have your current book is called Shaped by the Sea. And I know you worked for a number of years towards producing that book. Now, do you set off with a project in mind? Do you build yourself a kind of picture of where you want to go with it? And how does that influence when you're in? Because I, I know that you went to a couple of locations that you and I both know well, specifically to make images for that project. Now, do, does that influence how you engage with that landscape? You know, do you look in a different way or do you just feel that by doing your own thing, then the images that you need will somehow present themselves to you? Yeah, that's um, an interesting question. I, I must say that I started um, even as a professional photographer without the urge to work in projects uh, that much. I, I was the photographer that went to a place on a certain day and, and was inspired by many things and s just started taking photographs to whatever inspired me at that moment. Um, and I, I still try to keep this uh, spontaneous approach. Uh, I don't want to have a, a burden on my back uh, for you must take now this, this and this images for that project and then we can uh, cross them off and uh, go to the next uh, next ones. Uh, I do think that uh, having a, a theme um, yeah, helps me to focus my creativity and my, my inspiration and uh, I'm smart enough to get a theme that is very broad. Um, <laughs> so I mean, see, you you can look at uh, the sand patterns that are created and, and are washed away after the next wave. You can look at the cliffs that are uh, polished in, in in the course of centuries or, or even thousands of years. Uh, you can look at the waves, and uh, I, there are so many things. Right. Um, that fit into this theme if you have a broad approach. So usually I just start with an, a central idea. Uh, in this case, it was photographing the Atlantic coast of Europe, so the, the wild side of Europe, um, and in combination with this shape by the sea. So what does the sea with the landscape? Because I, I just didn't want to take uh, just uh, photographs of seascapes. Uh, I wanted to to have a bit of focus and, and maybe a personal element and I, I had to, the idea that that it was probably not done before in this way that this also helps because uh, um, it's easier to, uh, to to get attention for it later on um, and I also like to create books that are not are already there uh, or projects right, that, that already have been done so um, but usually I, I start very broad. I just go to places I like, uh, immerse myself in the landscape, take pictures without the burden of a theme or uh, thinking I, I need that or I need that, uh, and just create whatever I like and I want and, and what I feel. And then maybe halfway a project or maybe 60, 70% when I started to think about the book and, and talk um, with my designer, which was in this case uh, Sandra Bartoja, which is also a very talented ah. landscape and nature photographer and, and yes. yeah, someone with great feeling for beauty and aesthetics. Um, so she did the, the image flow and the, and the book design. And we had a lot of talks, right? talks like this is actually about uh, what images, which images work together and which don't. Um, so at this stage in the project, 60, 70%, then I started to think, okay, maybe 
I need a bit more winter or a bit more uh, wild right. images uh, for the balance in the book because you, you want to have the variation. Sure. And that's where I, I focus maybe a little bit more and choose a location. Uh, well, I, I went to the Ultra Hebrides, for instance, in two times in winter because I I wanted to have some winter images and, and more drama and not because um, I was there in October and it was it was horrible weather, meaning very warm and cold and sunny <laughs> <laughs> and that was not what i came for so uh, no so in, in at, at the second part of a project i take these kind of decisions to you know to to balance uh, the results and to maybe so did add the, things up. and this is why i was curious about it was because d does the does the name of the project come first or do you tend to find I yourself understand. with a collection of images that you then think ah right well this is the makings of something well, it is a, a, a process uh, that is that keeps on uh, evolving during the project. Um, it's not that when I start, I already have a script and a theme and uh, chapters and everything. There's a lot of uh, insight that comes later when I when I'm okay. uh, already uh, halfway or even further and. I'm not sure about the title and the, and the theme. I think it, uh, it it came on pretty early, okay. but it just started with the the idea to do something with the Atlantic coast of Europe. So, uh, and the book's still available, isn't it? It is through my website. Uh, you can. Uh, still I'll put the link. Yes. I'll put the link in the notes below. Uh, appreciate and it. Strongly urge anybody to to buy a copy because. Your work is just an inspiration. It always has been. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a funny story. When Adam Gibbs and I were in the Gobi last year, uh, we were we spent a week shooting together in the Gobi Desert, and um, we'd be sort of we'd pitch up at some new area of sand dunes, and we'd just look at each other and just say, "What would Theo do?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> that was, that was our go-to. To, to yeah. Just well, there, there's the obvious thing. But what would Theo do? And that, that was our that was our joke for the entire trip. Was because uh, I know when I, I, like when, I mentioned, <laughs> when I mentioned to Adam that I was talking to you, uh, it was just everyone's really excited because you know I think this is the beauty of this Vision and Light series is that first of all I just get to talk to my friends, which is just awesome, um, and yeah. secondly I think I, I just love the trying to get into the inside story you know trying to find a bit more about your motivation and and it's been really enlightening i've i've, I've really enjoyed talking with you and i hope we can get to do it again sometime likewise. yes i would be pleased thanks yeah <laughs> <laughs> but what i'm going to do is i'll put i'll put links down below for uh, your website and anything else that you want us to promote for you and uh, we will hopefully get to meet face to face again at some time in the future it would sure be lovely to yep. it would be lovely to go out and shoot together at some point it's something we haven't had the pleasure of doing yet but hopefully one day cool. we'll get to do that yeah it would be great yeah but for now theo bosboom thank you very much it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and thank uh, you. Yep. yet again such a fan it's uh <laughs> likewise mate and thank you very much for inviting me it was a uh, was a pleasure and an honor to do this you're welcome, man. Anytime. Okay. Have a nice day. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.